Welcome to the Promised Land Retreat Center, where we are taping the worship service for June 14th for the Emanuel Congregational Church, UCC of Watertown, New York. I'm so happy to have you here, and I hope that you will enjoy this time of worship together. Today, I would like to uh, let the members of the church know that there was a meeting last evening of the transition team and with the final approval of the trustees we plan to be opening our church for worship again on July 12. I know that we've all been waiting for this for a long time and we'll be happy to be back there to worship. We just want to be very sure that we can create a safe environment for all of us to come into to praise the Lord. So. For today, we're here at the Retreat Center, and I would ask you to join in singing with me one of your favorite hymns, In the Garden. The words would have come um, with your letter this week, the lyrics for your hymns. Please hear these words of invocation. O God, our soul waits for you. Our ears are attentive to your word. 
we hope for a clear understanding of your will for us. Let this time of meeting draw us together in unity with a sense of direction and purpose for our church and our individual lives. Renew us within so that nothing we face around us can undermine our faith or cause us to despair. Claim us all as sisters and brothers of Jesus Christ and help us to reflect this kinship in all that we say or do. And now I would ask you to join your spirit with me as we pray. O oh Lord, we ask you to strengthen our faith in Christ. We ask you to sustain and guide Christians with, their, with his gifts along the way to full unity. Let us, we pray, ask you, O oh Lord, for the gift of unity and peace for the world. We ask you, O oh Lord, for the gifts of your spirit. Enable us to penetrate the depth of the whole truth and grant that we may share with others the goods you have put at our disposal. Teach us to overcome divisions. Send us your spirit to lead to full unity your sons and daughters in obedience to your will through Christ our Lord who taught us this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today I'm not going to read the scripture first. It will be uh, blended in with the sermon. Uh, last week, I hope you saw last week's worship service, uh, Vicki Landers did a beautiful message um, on current events in our country and on the death of George Floyd and the resulting from it. Uh, that message talked about how a counterfeit $20 bill, dark skin and racism resulted in the senseless death of George Floyd. And we wonder how can this happen in the land of the free and the home of the brave? But apparently incidents like that have happened more often than we would like to think in different settings, to different people, in different countries around the world but always to those who have less power or are less privileged or are a little bit different from the majority and always to those who are not like us. We are all different from one another, yet we are all created by one and the same God who calls us to be one. Sometimes it feels more comfortable to join together with people who look more like us or act more like us. But why is that? Does it give us a safe a sense of safety? Are we hoping that we might be accepted by them since they seem to be the same? Is it natural to feel that way? Or have we been conditioned by life experience to think that way? All questions worthy of another thought. I'd like to share some accounts of inclusivity from the Bible today. And the first is from Jesus' own lips. It is from his last night in the garden with his disciples. He's actually praying to God for his disciples. But it's also a teachable moment because he knows that the disciples can hear the words that he is speaking. And so he shares with God his concerns for his disciples and prays for them. I am going to be reading from the book of John, chapter 17, verses 20 through 23. 
And this is the part of Jesus' prayer to God for all believers. And when I say all believers, I mean not just the disciples that are with him in the garden. My prayer is not for them alone. See, it's not for my disciples alone, God. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. So in this scripture, Jesus is asking God for unity of all believers. Jesus' prayer for his disciples is a reminder that he has come to teach them what God has placed in his heart that the love and joy that he has shown them has also come from God. So that not only would they be one, but that everyone that learned about Jesus from them would also be one. Notice that he did not say, let any other male Jew be one with us. Jesus prayed that all who came to believe in him would be one. That's us. Jesus prayed for us to be included that night in the garden, that we would all be one. The next story is from Acts 10, and this story takes place after Jesus' resurrection and after the coming of the promised Holy Spirit. The disciples are totally recharged, and they're traveling around sharing the good news of Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit that has also come in force. Simon Peter was ministering in Joppa and he was staying with Simon the Tanner. And so we hear these words from Acts chapter 10. This is a little bit longer story, but I pray that you will stay with me. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing, however, they were not Jews. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier, who was one of his attendants, and he told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Meanwhile, in Joppa, about noon the following day, as they were on the journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. 
and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, who asked him, of course, to go with him back, uh, back to um, Cornelius' house. And so he did go with the men, and when he got there and had the opportunity to speak to Cornelius, he said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or to visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without any objection. Peter had been raised up in the Jewish tradition. In that tradition, they were to keep to themselves. They had many laws in their faith. And one of those laws were that they were not to associate with people outside of their faith. Now, Peter had held on to these divisive traditions and prejudices, despite the years that he spent with Jesus. Remember the stories that Jesus told of the Good Samaritan and the woman at the well? Despite these powerful teachings against discrimination, Peter still clung to what he had learned as a child. The personal dream that God sent Peter was to remind him once and for all that no one was outside of God's blessing. We are all different, but also one in Jesus. The animals on the sheet that were lowered down contained many animals that Peter would have been taught in the Jewish faith were unclean and therefore not to be eaten by Jews. But the message being repeated three times in a dream told P Peter that not one of those animals was to be considered unclean again. No one is born prejudiced. All of us have been made prejudiced by either experiencing something negative or by hearing someone else's comments or by pattering, patterning ourselves by someone else's actions. Sometimes we are unaware of those feelings of prejudice. They are deeply ingrained and we have made them our own, sometimes without even thinking about it. So when you get a strong negative feeling, ask yourself, why do I feel this way about that particular thing or about that particular person? Does it feel right? Does it hurt anyone else? Perhaps you can walk away from some of those old teachings as Peter did that day. Some years ago, I remember America as being referred to as the melting pot. We are a land of immigrants except for the Native Americans who we have treated terribly since the beginning of our time together, we are all immigrants here in this country. Being the melting pot was the idea that here in America, our differences are all blended together and we all become the same. That idea at some point was strongly objected and objected to and rejected. It is so wrong. We are all beautiful in our differences. It is in the gathering of our differences that America can find its greatest strengths. To make us all look and act exactly the same would be a tragedy indeed. It is in the power of our ability to think differently that keeps us from being forced 
into the same little box. We also have to allow and encourage others to celebrate their differences. We cannot try to make everyone the same or to gain power over them if they do not wish to be or cannot be like us. All different and yet one in the spirit, a beautiful mosaic. For our last scripture, I would like to use the words of Apostle Paul from his letter to the Philippians in chapter 2, where Paul begs the people of Philippi to be humble and put others first, as Jesus did. Today, we once again are being challenged as Christians to be of one spirit and one mind, despite our obvious and cherished differences. The challenge to Christians today is no different than the one that Paul was making to the Philippians 2,000 years ago. This like-mindedness and unity that Paul is admonishing us to recognize and to promote in our community is based on our threefold experience with Christ. Our experience with Christ, with God's love, and the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the love of the Father expressed in the Son that remains with us today. In other words, God is one, and God calls us to be one in Him. As Paul writes, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the spirit, and of one mind. In faith, we understand this admonition, but we also know, in fact, that the unity that God calls us to still eludes us. How are we to live into this unity? Well, the Spirit is kind enough to give us the answer to that question in this passage from the letter to the Philippians as well. The key, as always, is humility. Paul says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value all others above yourself not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. There is, though, one thing that can separate us from the love of God, and that is pride. There's been a lot of discussion about taking the knee in the news lately. Some of us see it as a sign of weakness, some a sign of protest, and still others as a sign of humility and unity. You cannot take the knee if you are full of yourself. It is a position assumed by the humble. Traditionally, a loyal subject would take a knee before the queen. An ardent lover takes a knee before they're intended, before they ask them to marry them. Jesus took a knee before each of his disciples as he washed their feet. In humbleness, he was showing them that he did not wish to be a dictator, but instead a servant to them, someone who would put their needs before his own. Verse 10 of this reading says, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. They would not be taking a knee or bowing to a dictator or ruler, but they would be taking a knee in honor and in awe of the one who has the power to rule over us, but instead humbles himself to live with us, to love us, and to teach us how to love. You are not like me. You? You are not like me? Praise God for that. Drop to your knee to thank Jesus that we can still be one in the Spirit. 
Jesus, who being found in the appearance as a man, humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even to death on a cross. We Christians are called then to imitate Christ with a humility and love that he modeled to us. May we turn our backs on the idea that we can exploit and have power over those who are less privileged than us. May we accept them as they are and celebrate their differences and instead reach out to offer them the best of ourselves and our friendship. May we put their needs above our own. The unity that we are called to as Christians will be found in the humble. Christ-like, being Christ-like is showing love for one another. We must accept and love each other as we are, celebrating our differences, being as one in the Spirit. We remember Jesus' only commandment to us, love one another as I have loved you, so must you love one another. May we pray. Lord, help us to fix our minds on you alone. Help us to recognize and to turn away from whatever divides us. Unite us in humble, Christ-like love for one another so that the world will see your love in us and be drawn to it. We pray earnestly, believing in the power of your most holy name, Jesus. I'd like to, you to sing with me once again, if you would be willing, and I hope you're truly singing, not leaving me alone in this. We have a song that I hope you know, you may not know it really well, but it's called Help Us Accept Each Other. And if you choose not to sing, I hope that you either listen to the words or read them off the lyric sheet that was sent with the letter this week.
together today, I would like you to pray with me a prayer that was included in your letter this week along with the lyrics. It was uh, written by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. We have permission to use it. And I would like you to pray it along with me if you could in your homes. It is titled, Prayer to Heal Racial Division. We thank you, O Lord, for in your loving wisdom, you created one human family with a diversity that enriches our communities. We pray to you, O Lord, that we always recognize each member of this human family as being made in your image and beloved by you with worth and dignity. We pray to you, O Lord, that we may envision a way forward to heal the racial divisions that deny human dignity and the bonds between all human beings. We pray to you, O Lord, that we may affirm each person's dignity through fair access for all to economic opportunity, housing, education, and employment. We pray to you, O Lord, that we may have eyes to see what is possible when we reach out beyond our fear, beyond anger, to hold the hand of our sisters and brothers. We thank you, O Lord, for your call and challenge to us, that we may reveal your teachings and your love through our actions to the end of racism and to proclaim that we are all your children, heirs to your sacred creation. Amen. I hope that you will keep this prayer and read it often and think deeply about it and truly pray it in your time of quiet with the Lord. And now may God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bless and be with you both today and every day forward. Amen. About the walk. Do you know your Christian song? Did you want to oh, we have another song that um, we could add to this. I forgot. Leanne and I talked about it earlier this week. And it's, we, they will know we are Christians by our love. I'm afraid I don't have the lyrics out for that, but... Um, Sing along wherever you can, or just enjoy it. 